right? I've titled this uh, sermon this morning, Confidence in God. We all have confidence in God, don't we? How is your confidence? Have you put a confidence check on you? And if we have confidence in God, it's because we've learned something through the trials that we've been through, right? Through the school of hard knocks. Um, And we've all been through some of those hard knock classes. But we're going to be looking at this morning at uh, Psalms. And in Psalms um, 62, David expresses his confidence and his dependence that, uh, that he has placed on the Lord. And we know that David had went through, had a lot of trials. And so I want to just look this morning real quickly at what David had to say and can see if we can identify with that um, and learn from it and grow from it. In Psalm 62, verse 1, it says, Truly, my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. Truly, my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. Now, there's a few things I want to note about this statement. First of all, it says, My soul waits upon God. And the soul is, whenever you hear the soul, the soul is, a, is that part of us. See, we all have, a bot, all have a body, we all have a spirit, and we all have a soul. And so the soul part is the mind, the will, and the emotions. Now, so what David is saying here is my mind and my will and my emotions wait upon God. And how many know that takes a lot of effort? At least it does for me. It doesn't come natural to us. It's it's not easy. Um, But we have to learn to take control or to take a step or to make an effort to bring our mind and our emotions and our will in, in line with what God would have us do. Sometimes we have to recall when we're in a certain situation the things that he has already brought us through. We have to remember those things, especially if if we find ourselves in a place of panic. Now, David says here that his soul waits. And so when we look at the word waits, it says that he is saying his soul soul has become still, or, or that is his desire, that is the direction he is going into, is that his soul would be still. Whatever difficulties he is facing, whatever the dangers that he was in, though we or you or I or David would be discouraged, though he would be fearful, No matter what, even when, even when we think for our own selves that we do not deserve God's help, that we haven't been where we needed to be, we have to, we have to take that step to become still. Okay. When your back's against the wall. Ever had you feel like you've had your back against the wall? Yeah. What was the situation? Doesn't matter. What the situation is, when it's you, and you feel like you're backed up against the wall, you have nowhere else to go. Does it matter what brought it on? And I thought of Israel when they were facing the Red Sea. And sometimes we feel like we're having to face our own Red Sea, right? But they had left Egypt. Pharaoh had said go. And 1.2 million or however many there were left. And it wasn't long before Pharaoh changed his mind and he came after him again. And they were surrounded from behind the army, the whole entire Egyptian army behind them. And that silly red sea right in front of them. And surely they had to wonder, why did God lead us in this direction? Why did we come to this place? What are we going to do? There's nowhere to go. It's an impossible obstacle. 
There's no way we can cross that. We can't get across it. We're going to be killed. Look in Exodus chapter 14. And see what, what was said. Chapter 14, verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Now the Lord, or the Lord said through Moses, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. So there are times when we listen, when we listen with our heart, we can hear the Lord saying to us, now you just need to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I really kind of like this because it says he'll show you that salvation today for those Egyptians. So let's say those Egyptians were the enemy, right? They, were, they had a, the enemy coming in behind them. For those Egyptians who you see today, you're not going to ever have to deal with them again. You'll see them no more. You'll see them no more. And that he's going to show them that day the salvation of the Lord. For the Egyptians who you have seen today, you shall see no more again forever. Ever. Not forever. Gone, gone, gone. Verse 14 says, And the Lord shall fight for you. How many know that's what we all need to know, that it's the Lord fighting for us? Amen. We've talked about that before. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Not too many years, or too many years ago, too many weeks ago, I had a sermon. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, we'd never got through it. If it hadn't been for the Lord who was on our side. Amen. He says here, the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. You know, David must have had or must have faced something that day that he wrote this, this in Psalm 62. Something was on his mind. He had his own Red Sea that God had brought him through. was interesting, go ahead, oh, did you go, yeah, you went ahead and put that, no, go ahead and put up 62.1 again, Andrew. The part I don't like, I guess, or when I think about it, is that I have to wait, my soul waits. We know that God hears our prayers, but how, but how often do we see a situation immediately change from that moment? We don't. Not very often. We pray. We, we pray for our children. We pray for our grandchildren. We pray for our families. We pray for our friends. And then it seems like the next time we're praying for our children, we're praying for our grandchildren, our family, and our friends, and we don't see a change. We pray for... For the man that Bill mentioned, three weeks now, there's been no change. He's not got any better, but he's not got any worse, but he's still there. And that's where our problem is when our soul, our mind, and our will and emotions has to wait before we see what God has done. We don't always see it immediately, and we have to remember that. Yet, we still have to remain still, don't we? Still, I'm talking still in our emotions, our mind and our will. But you know what controls us most of the time, a lot of times, is our, our, the way we think, and then our emotions get tied into it, yes. right? Because if, if you don't live, if you're, you may not be like I am, but I live in, in, in this big world called the what-ifs. That's a lot of my worries is the what is. What is tomorrow going to bring? What if this doesn't happen? What is going to happen in the situation? And then what if? And I don't want to live that way. I want to be still and wait on God and see and, and just trust God to work it out. But I have to wait some time. He says from 
Now he says, my soul waits for God, and from him comes my salvation. Now I want to just give you a little bit of information. In Psalm 62, the word salvation is used four different times. In verse 1, 2, 6, and something. But when I looked up the word salvation in Hebrew, it has a little kind of a different meaning than I thought it would. Because when you hear the word salvation, immediately we think, that we are saved through our faith in Christ Jesus. And that is true. That is salvation. But salvation to in, in these texts is talking about that we are saved, um, that we are saved from something, that we are delivered, that there's been uh, an aid like in Oklahoma, now they send aid to Oklahoma. And God, and David is saying, He is my salvation, or from Him cometh my help. It comes my deliverance. It, from Him comes my victory. From Him comes the, the answer to, my good, or to the good that is coming to me. It all comes from Him. From this situation that I am in, the situation that I find myself in, whether that situation was brought on by my own stupidity or my own neglect or my own will, whatever that situation is, or whether that situation that I'm in, and I'm saying situation because you all have your own situation. Right? You all have your own circumstances. Whether it's something that is self-made or, or whether it's something that came in from someone else, I have to wait and still myself and realize that he is my victory. He, that's what it's saying. He is my salvation. In him is my salvation. I know the answer will come from him and he will make a way when there is no way. Now isn't it good to know that God can make a way when there is no way? Yes. Right? Yes. Because if we didn't know this, if we hadn't learned it, oh what a panic we would be in and we would be without hope. Now David had a reason for this confidence that he had had placed in the Lord and this dependence that he had on him. And we can see that reason in verse 2. Because here's what David says in verse 2. He is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense and I shall not be greatly moved he is whose rock David claims him for himself see when you're if it, when we get to the certain place we have to stop and be still and then we have you know he's talking he's talking here do you ever think about it Who's David talking to? Oh, you guys don't do that, do you? You don't talk to yourself. If you talk to yourself, raise your hand. Oh, I'm not the only one. See, what David is doing here, he's talking to himself. He's saying, he is my rock. He is my salvation. He is my deliverance. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. And I looked up the meaning of defense, and it was kind of strange. Now, you've got to follow me here because I don't want to bore you, but I found this interesting. So defense, then, if you look it up, it, 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 the first thing it says is cliff. Cliff. Now, we don't have cliffs here, a whole lot of them in Indiana, but you get down there in south. In Tennessee, down there in the mountains, or somewhere in the mountains, you see a cliff. You know what I'm talking about, right? But it says, then, right after that, it says, an unaccessible place. 
So defense, God is my defense, means he has placed me or placed you in an unaccessible place. Unaccessible to anything. Unaccessible for you. You are in a place where nothing by any means can hurt you. Nothing can hurt you. David says, I, I shall not be greatly moved. I shall not be greatly moved. Does that mean that he's going to be a little bit moved? I don't know. It means he's not going to be greatly moved. It means he's not going to be undone. It means he's not going to be ruined. Maybe a little bit moved. But he's not going to lose. Right? He's not going to freak out. Right? Now look in verse 5. He's still talking to himself. Now it's real obvious. Look what he says. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. Now he's talking out loud to himself. And how many people, you know what I've realized, and you have too, and I, you know, is that what we say, what we let come out of our mouth is the it leads our direction, right? We hear what we say. We hear what we say to ourselves, and our soul will hear that. But what he's saying is, my soul, wait thou only upon God. Well, you find yourself in that situation, and you don't know what to do, and sometimes you just may have to say, okay, all right, Terry, just wait. Wait on God. Just wait. Be still and wait on God. Don't, this moment, don't do anything. Don't think anything. Don't expect the worst. Don't freak out. Don't go bananas. Right? Just wait on God. So David is building himself up by talking to himself. And he says, my, my soul waits what? This time he says, my soul waits only only upon God. I'm not going anywhere else. I'm not seeking any more advice. I'm not picking up the telephone calling anybody. I'm not doing anything. I'm picking, I'm going to sit here and I got my Bible in front of me and God, if there's a word that I need to hear, you yeah. give it so I can hear it. You may help me turn to the right page so I can see that verse that you want me to have. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not picking up a book. I'm not going to the internet to get the answer. I'm going to wait and wait only upon the Lord for my expectation is from Him. I expect something from Him and he, if I wait and just give Him time, He is going to deliver that. Now that really isn't the way we are, is it? I'm telling us the way we should be, the way we ought to be, but sometimes it's instantaneous reaction, right? We just instantly have to do this and we have to take care of ourselves because that's our nature to take care of ourselves. And I'm so glad that we have a God that is loving and understanding to us and toward us. And, and even in spite of ourselves, He's still there waiting for us to wait on Him. Can't you see that? I wonder when Terry's going to come to the place where she finally decides to just wait on me. My expectation is from him, David says, and he's going to show me the path that I have to take yes. and that he'll find a way and I must let my soul be silent so that I can hear. Now, I, I was thinking, does waiting on God mean not doing anything? No, I don't think it does. It means being still. Because I, I, I want to look back here just for a second. Now I don't want you to turn there. But see back there when those Egyptians were facing the Red Sea. And then God said, be still. 
and see salvation of the Lord. In the next verse, he says, the Lord's going to fight for you. And then in the next verse, that says, and the Lord said unto Moses, wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. So you want to be still. You want to wait and see the salvation of the Lord and then go forward. I think he told Moses, listen to this, but lift up, but lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Well, it doesn't seem like Moses just sat there and said, okay, I'm, I'm still before you, God. We're all still before you, so we're just going to do nothing. That's not the way it works. I think in the stillness, God will give us direction. That's what I'm saying. How many know we can't just lie down and bury our hand, heads in, or like an ostrich, right? We have to go forward. But we can ask for that direction from God and by letting ourselves be still or be silent, maybe we will be able to hear him when he <coughs> excuse me, when he says be still. We have to take and it's not easy. I'm not saying it is easy, but I am saying this is a good word. This is a good thing. It is a good thing for us to learn. Verse 6, he continues on. He only is my rock. Did I give you that one? And my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. It, you know, David kind of sounds like when, when he's doing all this talking, he just repeats himself a lot. Doesn't it kind of seem like you've done heard this before? He's my rock, my salvation. He's my defense. He's talking to himself. Can you talk to yourself today? He's my defense. He's my defense. He's my defense. He's put me in an unaccessible place. I'm in that unaccessible place. That's where I am, and I shall not be moved. But what did he say in verse 2? I shall not be greatly moved. Now this time he's saying, I'm not going to be moved at all. I'm not going to be moved at all. Before I might be great, I shall not be greatly moved. But now he's saying, I'm not going to be moved at all. Verse 7 he says, in God, he's kind of like he's repeating himself, is my salvation. But see, he's growing as he does that. He is my rock. He is my deliverer. I shall not be greatly moved. He is my rock. He is my defense. I shall not be moved at all. And God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength. And my refuge is in God. Amen. My refuge is in God. And I looked up the word refuge, because that's kind of a no-brainer. We all got it in our head, right? What we think refuge is. Place to hide, right? That's my first thing. If, I, if you said, Terry, what does ref, that God is my refuge, what would, what would I tell you? I'd say it's a place to hide. It says, in, when you look it up, it says it's a shelter. But it also, that refuge also means my hope. Or my trust. And this is what I got to think and then that that refuge, or let's say hope. Okay? Let's say hope. Then hope becomes not something I do, but it becomes a location somewhere I've been place. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but sometimes it's hard to stir up hope, isn't it? When you're going through something. Or well, if we can look at it different, that God is my refuge. And so no longer do I look at hope as something I have to have in me. 
hope is somewhere I have been put. It's in that inaccessible place where no one else can get to me. I don't have to stir up that in myself. And trust is another definition of refuge. And so for the thing, trusting then is not something I do, but it's a place to be. Does that make sense? God is my refuge. When you make God your refuge, you're just giving it all to him. And you don't have to worry about, do I have enough trust? Lord, I'm, I'm trying to trust you. No, he takes you and he puts you in a place that it just exists. When you say, I don't, I have this hope, I don't know if I can stir up enough in, within me. No, 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 no. When you get, make God your refuge, he puts you in hope becomes not something that you stir up. It's just a place. It's a place that you are, a place to go. I believe that is why Job could say, though he slay me, yet shall I trust in him. Though he slay me, yet shall I am trust in him. He's placed me here almost in a geographical location that's known only to him, that's unaccessible to any harm. I'm safe. I shall not be moved at all because God is my refuge. Sometimes we have to stand up and we can say, hey, devil, you may try to take me down. See, you can't take God down. Amen. You can't take God down. You can't take God down. And he has put me here in this place, Amen. in this cliff, in this unaccessible place that you can't even get to, there lives hope, there lives grace, there lives my defense. Nothing I have to do, nothing I have to say. God. It's God. Verse 8 then, David says that he's given just a little, he quit talking to himself. Now guess who he's talking to? He's talking to us. See, he says, I, I've learned this. I've learned this. He says, trust him in, in him at all times, ye people, and pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. We're going we're gonna to stop there. That's the last verse. Selah. 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 Think about it. That's what it means. Stop and meditate on this. Trust in Him at all times. Pour out your heart before Him. David says, trust in Him. Pour out your heart before Him. You know why David says that? Because he trusted in him. He learned. And because he had learned to pour out his heart before God. You see, David wasn't perfect. David had a lot of sin in his life. But he had a heart for God. And a heart for loving God. And he caught God's heart. But when you pour out your heart before God, if there's sin in your life, pour it out. Right? And we all have something and if you don't pour it out before God, then it, it, it's in there, in your head, all the time. If you have a grievance that you want to talk to the Lord about, just pour out your heart to Him. If you have a desire, pour it out to Him. If you have an impossible situation, pour it out to Him. Right? Do you ever sit down and think, oh my gosh, I've got all these people I need to be praying for. And you get that minute alone and you, and you, 
and when the kids are gone and the family's gone and, and you take that minute and you get down on your knees and say, oh God, I'm so sorry about the way I've been. You know, and you find yourself sometimes, I just, we get to where we're just pouring the, all these things out that has come in. And sometimes, I, I'm, I'm saying, we have to get our place to that place with the Lord before we can really begin to pray for others. Right? It is, it is, a, um, it is to pour out our heart is to depend on Him to perform all things for us. Depend on His wisdom, His power, His goodness, His grace. <sighs> David says, trust in Him at all times and pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. A refuge. He is our refuge. He is that place to go. In Psalms 91, David said, And he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty. There is a secret place. But it takes a little bit of pouring out to get there. We have to learn to trust everything. I still keep going back. If it had not been the Lord who was on my side, and fill in the blank. Right? If it had not been the Lord that was on my side. And we all have our blanks that we can fill in. Stand if you will. I want you to make an effort this week to go back and just review some of the things that were said in this psalm because there were so many so many that our salvation God is our salvation our place of victory our aid, our help when we need it, when we're in trouble He is our rock our rock, He's our rock He's that cliff bow your heads if you will and just think of where you've been and where, where you've what he's already got you through, and we know he'll get he'll get us through everything. He's our defense. He's your expectation. Okay, just say this to yourself, or or whisper it to him. Let's be like David. Oh no, let's do it this way. Let's be like David, and just say to yourself. He is my salvation. He's my rock. He is my defense. He is my expectation. He is my glory. He is my strength. He is my refuge. 